County, still protesting we are. Some today do not like the idea of the Reformation having taken place. Those in the Roman Catholic Church, for example, wish that we had never revolted. Those in the Eastern Church don't understand what happened in the West. Neither are they likely to, as long as they remain in darkness. There are some today who are counted as sons of the Reformation, particularly Lutheran bodies, that seek reconciliation with the Roman Catholic Church in the West. And they have formed a lowest common denominator kind of Christianity and suggested that we kind of patch up our old differences. To me, that's amazing. That is just so stunning that 500 years after the Reformation, there have been bodies in the last 50, 60, 70 years that have sought to undo what Martin Luther started. I, for one, will not be counted among them. I believe that the Reformation was an act of God. It was God raising up His servants to shout out from the rooftops that salvation is based on Scripture alone, is by grace alone, and faith alone, and Christ alone for the glory of God alone. And we are the heirs, we are the recipients of that biblical gospel, and we should never be ashamed of it. Today we'll look at a text in the book of Galatians, a book loved by Luther. In fact, he uh, referred to this uh, book with the affectionate term, My Katie, which was his uh, wife's name. Apart from Romans, I guess, Galatians is the strongest text in the New Testament concerning the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And it's upon this text that I draw your attention today. If you have your Bible, please open with me to chapter 2 of Galatians. And I'd like to start reading from verse 11 to the end of the chapter. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. But before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away in their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We, who are Jews by nature, not sinners, Gentile, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ.
Christ is dead in vain. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for allowing us to be here today. We pray, God, that you would be honored in our midst, that indeed you alone would be glorified from our time of worship together. And as we continue to worship through your word, as we hear it, God, we long that you touch our hearts, revive us, renew in us the way of everlasting, God. Renew in us the path of obedience to your word. And may we glorify you we proclaim this wonderful gospel that alone brings glory to your holy name. We ask this for the sake of Christ, who is all true Christians and say, love me and gave himself for me. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. This 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 book is, is such an amazing text that if you go back to the beginning, you'll notice that Paul, when he begins this letter, is very unlike Paul because he doesn't usually uh, start off with this kind of fierce language. He, he usually has a kind word to say to the recipients uh, and greets them and this kind of thing. Well, not here. Not here, not at all. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And we know, we've heard this so many times, that Paul says in this text that if you hear another gospel, even if it be from an angel of God, a minister of God, a servant of God, an angel, a messenger of God, even if we ourselves, Paul says, preach something other than what you heard in the first, that person is to be anathema. This is, this is not trivial, folks. This is not something we should take lightly. The very true gospel is at stake. In our Sunday school today, we looked at 1 Peter. And in chapter 5, verse 12 of that text, it tells us that Peter was writing to remind the recipients of that letter about the true grace of God. The true gospel is at stake. And so when he speaks of this gospel which was preached, he says it is not of man. He goes on in this letter to tell him. He said, if I was trying to please men, I would not suffer reproach for the cross of Christ. This letter is a watershed in this matter of the gospel. He recounts historic incident when in Antioch, when the disciples in Jerusalem had heard about the blessing of Paul's ministry, they sanctioned it, so to speak, and they sent Peter to go and investigate. And Peter went and he rejoiced that these Gentiles were trusting in Christ and they were becoming a part of the body of Jesus Christ. And because salvation was by grace and not by the works of the law, he would sit and eat with them and Rejoice in the fellowship of Christian social interaction, which look beyond any rituals or ceremonies or legalities of the past. And yet when these of the circumcision came, Peter compromised. And Paul calls him out in this passage. Or he reminds the Galatians that he did so what it had. As a footnote, let me tell you about a book I had to read while I was in seminary years ago. Earthing the Gospel by a man called Gerald Arbuckle. He was a Catholic, Roman Catholic. Why I was required to read this at Southern Seminary is still beyond me. Nonetheless, I read the book, I wrote my reputation of it, and I passed the course through the skin of my teeth. Nonetheless, in this book, Gerald Arbuckle said that according to Galatians, it was Peter that had to straighten out Paul. Why? Because Gerald Arbuckle is a Roman Catholic. And Gerald Arbuckle submits to the Pope. 
And according to his theology, Peter was the first pope. Therefore, Peter cannot be the one error, can he? No, it is simple. But as a good Protestant that I am, I open my Bible. Praise be to people like John Knox, right? That fought so that we could have these scriptures. Praise be to God for people like Tyndale that died so that we could have these scriptures. I opened to Galatians and read again, and uh, my suspicions were obviously confirmed because I knew the text did not say that Peter straightened out Paul in Galatians 2, but rather it was the other way around. But these are the Catholic lies that will continue to be propagated in the name of a false religion sanctioned only by the Antichrist Pope himself, and I say no, I stand upon the word of God like Martin Luther. And I defy the Pope and all his ministers and all his angels because the word of God cannot be broken. Cannot be broken. Here we have Paul straightening out Peter, so to speak. And telling us that he was not being faithful to the truth of the gospel. I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. When they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of a circumcision. He did not walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. Paul is my hero. Jesus is my savior. But Paul, a like mind person, a person of passion like we are as even James speaks of Elijah in his letter. Paul is a mere man. He's not the God man. He's a mere man and yet he is so sold out by this gospel of Jesus Christ that I long to emulate him. I long to be like him. He inspires me. challenged Peter in front of them all and he challenged him by saying why do you compel the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? In other words, why are you mandating that they succumb to these legalistic rituals so that they can be Christians? Why are you making them go from Gentile faith to Judaism to then Christianity? Can they not turn from the idols to God? He says, we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So why are you taking these works and putting them as a burden upon these people? And is that not what Catholicism is still doing today. In fact, the irony of the entire matter concerning the Reformation is that Protestant churches are mandating man-made rules and regulations and putting them on the shoulders of the people and saying you must do such and such before you can gain justification before God. What a travesty. Today you can't be saved unless you are baptized in a particular denomination. You can't be saved unless you give a tithe and make sure you send to the board of elders the receipt. You can't get into heaven without going to Sunday school at least 48 weeks out of the year or whatever it is that people mandate today. There are those that 
so you can't get to heaven if you don't read the right version of the Bible. I've been accused of that one. Yet let me go on record and say, I don't care which version you read. That will not get you into heaven. I do have a preference, however. Folks, when we add to this gospel, we are blaspheming our Lord. Paul ends this chapter with these words. He says, if I... If I do not, rather, he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Because if justification, if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He's dead in vain in two senses. If one, his death is necessary but not sufficient, He's dead in vain because then his death alone doesn't count. And if his death isn't necessary at all, but something else is required, then again his death is in vain. So the only way in which his death is not in vain is if we are justified and if we are sanctified and if we are saved solely by the work of Christ. Solus Christus. Christ alone. You cannot be saved by Jesus and Mary. You cannot be saved by Jesus and the saints. You cannot be saved by Jesus and the Pope. You cannot be saved by Jesus and works of your own doing. And if you try to be justified by these kinds of works, Paul tells us in this letter that you are not going to benefit from Christ. You can't put Jesus on par with anything else. Because as soon as you do that, you make his day in vain. You are coming under the anathema of another gospel. It must be Christ, Christ alone. Or it's not going to be a cross. And if you have any hope beyond that of Jesus Christ and His work, you have no hope at all. It is as simple as that. So, do we compromise on this issue? Do we do like Peter? On this occasion, do we let men dictate to us and do we cower before them? Do we fear men and thereby dare to change what God sanctions? Or should we stand against all men, acknowledging as Paul writes in the Roman letter, let God be true and every man a liar. I say we stand with Paul. I say we stand with Jesus. Because Paul is proclaiming Christ and Christ alone. Did he not say in that first letter to the Corinthians, I could have come and spent all this time teaching you all kinds of things, but I don't know anything else. He said, I don't want to know anything else, but Christ crucified. If we proclaim, he says in the second letter to Corinthians chapter 4, we don't come and preach ourselves, we come to preach Christ. Jesus is the Savior. You look to Him in faith that you are saved. If God gives you that grace to look to Him in faith, you don't need anything else. That's the whole point of the gospel. Why look to the traditions of men? Whether they be of Judaism or of Roman Catholicism, or of any other man-made tradition. We need the pure, unadulterated word of God alone. Sola Scriptura. 
Do you know what Catholics think about that? Let me tell you. They think that the church gave us the Bible. They think that without the church, we wouldn't have the Bible. You know what I say? It is the gospel that birthed the church. The counsel of the Lord is settled forever in heaven. The word of God is that alone which endures forever. The word of God is nothing more than a reflection of the mind of God. The word of God created the church, not the other way around. Bishops in the early church didn't gather around and decide what the Bible should be. They were led by the Holy Spirit to recognize what God had already inspired. What he had breathed out of his own mouth. That's why Jesus said that we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. The word of God has come out of the mouth of God. And that word that has come out of the mouth of God brought life and healing to the church, creating the church. Jesus said, I will build my church. The church didn't create the Bible. That is another lie that has been propagated by the Roman Catholic Church. No, it is the Word of God, sola scriptura. And it is the Christ of the Word, solus Christus. And it is faith alone, as these texts tell us, not by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ that we are justified, sola fide. We do not frustrate the grace of God, he says. Sola gratia, grace alone. And ultimately, it is to the glory of God alone. When Paul ends this letter in chapter 6, he says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. To God alone be the glory for the work that God alone has done in redeeming simple people unto his eternal kingdom. Why would we wish to stand compromised when God's word is so clear? It is for no other reason than the one that Peter was compromised with in this historical account that Paul recounts here in Galatians 2. The fear of man. And Jeremiah reminds us that we are cursed if we fear the flesh. We are cursed if we put our trust in man. If we value man and his views more than God's, like Peter Paul says in this text, Peter did, then we are no longer standing for the cross of Christ. You cannot say it any clearer than he says it in this lesson, in this, in this book. No man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet it is to be confirmed to no man disannulled or added thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were promises made, he said, and to seeds as of many know, 
but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. Christ. We do not need intercession of men or of angels. We do not need man-made religion or man-appointed figures of Christ. We do not need even the church for redemption. We need the gospel. The gospel. That gospel is about the grace of God through the work of His Son, the Lord Jesus, in obeying God, fulfilling the law, and dying on a cross as the curse which takes away our sin and brings righteousness to us, imputed by grace alone, through faith alone, not of works, so that nobody can boast before God. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Think on this, for otherwise Christ be dead in vain. Here it is, Jesus standing before Pilate, and he is spent because he has spent all night going from one place to another tried by the Sanhedrin, sent over here, sent over there, from one end of Jerusalem to another. Finally, he's before Pilate, and he can hardly stand. He can't even lift his hands. And the blood drips from him. And finally, the exchange comes, and Jesus has to confess to this man, Pilate, that he could have no power over him unless he'd be given him from heaven. And Pilate says, what shall I do with this man? He washes his hands. He says, you deal with him. And they say, crucify him, crucify him. And because he's a coward, he allows Jesus to be killed. And Christ goes up on that cross. And he hung there for six hours. And the wrath of God abound on him. And as Isaiah says, God crushed his son. So we got forgiveness. And we're going to turn from that to works. We're going to turn from that love manifested to sinful human beings in the very death of the Son of God, absorbing the wrath of God so that we would not go to hell, but that we could have forgiveness. We're going to turn from that. We're going to frustrate the grace of God. We're going to make it so that Christ died in vain. God forbid. God Let us stand with Paul. And let us defy men, whoever they may be, no matter how popular they are, no matter how loud they speak, no matter how much influence they carry. Let us stand against every single one of them that would defy this grace of God. Let us stand for Christ Jesus. Because no, my friends, Christ did not die in vain. Because his triumphant cry was, it is finished. Redemption accomplished for God's children, for the children that are scattered all over the world. And he will bring them one, and they will be one flock. No, oh, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Because the grace of God is the power of God to save everyone that believeth. Jew first, and also the Greek, unto the glory of the triune God, now and forever. Amen. God, let's pray. Far be it from us, Lord, to turn so easily from Him that called us into this grace unto another gospel. God have mercy on us that we may never be tempted to forsake you for the false teachings of men. 
Christ, our Lord, for his sake we 